children, we're going to begin today our next phase with a story. This is a story that I know from the first hand. It's not a story that I heard from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody. I know the people with whom this story happened and I know this story firsthand and I want to share it with you. It's also not a story of 200 years ago or a thousand years ago or even 50 years ago. It's a story that happened not very long ago. My friend, I have a friend, his name is Rabbi Chaim Slabatitsky. His wife's name is Chayla Slabatitsky. They grew up in Belgium, in Europe, in the city of Antwerp, Antwerpen in Belgium. And today they live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They are Chabad Shluchim, emissaries, ambassadors of Yiddishkeit in Fort Lauderdale. They've moved there in the year 2011, nine years ago. During their first year in Fort Lauderdale, one day before Pesach, Erev Pesach, Rabbi Chaim Slabatitsky went to visit a local Jewish doctor in order to give him Shmura Matzah so he would have it by the Pesach Seder. The doctor tells the rabbi, I can't speak to you right now. He was in the middle of a procedure, but thank you very much for the matzah. And then he tells Reb Chaim, he says, you see the woman in the corner of the waiting room? She's Jewish. And maybe she would also like some matzah for her seder. So what happens? Reb Chaim approaches the lady sitting in the waiting room, waiting for her turn to go to the doctor. She's sitting with a magazine. He goes over to her. He introduces himself. He says, hi. And he says, hi, I want to give you some matzah for Passover. She doesn't even look up. She says, leave me alone. I'm not religious. He says, I just want to give you some matzah for the holiday. You don't have to be religious. She says, I don't want anything from you. Rabbi Slavitsky thought maybe she's afraid it's going to cost her money. She didn't have money, he says. It's free, don't worry, no charge, just take the matzah. She says, I don't want your matzah, I don't believe in organized religion. So he took back the box of matzah. Instead, he reached out for one of, one of his new shiny business cards that he printed. It was in his jacket pocket. He, he left it on the chair near the woman. He knew that if he would give it to her, she wouldn't take it. He left it on the chair and he said, you can always reach out to me if you need anything. Have a wonderful holiday. And he left the office. A few minutes later, he forgot the story. He went on to his next mitzvah. Six months later, two days before Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Chaim Slavetitsky gets a telephone call. A woman is on the other line, and this is what she says. I am the rude lady from the doctor's office a few months ago who rejected your kind gesture to give me matzah. But I took your business card. Why am I calling you? My father is in the hospital, and the doctors gave him 48 hours to live. He asked if he could see a rabbi. You're the only rabbi I know whose telephone number I have, so I phoned you. Fifteen minutes later, Chaim Slabatitsky was in the hospital. The daughter, the woman, the rude lady, greeted him. And she tells him, my father has cancer, stage four. The illness is very, very serious. The doctor says he probably has a few days to live, two days, 48 hours. He's 78 years old. We're Jewish, but we never did anything Jewish in our life. So I'm confused why my father asked me to see a rabbi. My sister and I, the two daughters of this man, never had a bat mitzvah. We never went to temple. We never went to shul. We never went to synagogue. We never went to Hebrew school. Not even on the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, did we go to the synagogue. We spent our Sundays having fun, not going to Hebrew school. We are completely unaffiliated Jews, Jews who don't belong to any Jewish community. But my father wants to see a rabbi. 
Rabbi Chaim Slabatitsky goes into the room. A man, 78 years old, his name is Rami, laying on the bed, weak. He asks both of his daughters to leave the room. They leave the room. Rami turns to Reb Chaim and he says these words. I was born a Jew. I want to die as a Jew. Rabbi Slabatitsky nodded and he says, Rani, don't worry. When the time comes, I will do everything to make sure that you have a kosher Jewish burial. You were born as a Jew. You will die and be buried as a Jew. Rani shook his head. He said, Rabbi, you don't understand what I'm saying. I want to die as a Jew. The rabbi was confused. What do you mean? And he says, Rabbi, I was born a Jew, but I want to die as a Jew. You see, I never had a bris. I never had a circumcision. I want to die as a Jew. The door is closed, Rabbi. Do whatever you need to do. Do the bris right now. I want to die as a full-fledged, circumcised Jew with a bris. Guy probably thought every Rav, if you look like a Rav, you're probably also a mile. <laughs> he says, lock the door and do what you have to do right now. The Rabbi looks at him and says, Rani, I'm not a mile. <laughs> I can't do this. I can't just cut you. I can't do this. He says, so get me one. So I'll try to get you one. Promise me, Rabbi, promise me I'm going to die as a Jew. He says, I'm going to do whatever I can with God's grace to fulfill your last request. He went out of the room, started to call different people who do brisson. This is before Rosh Hashanah. And he found one in southern Florida who was ready to make the trip that afternoon. Remember, the doctors gave this man 48 hours to live. He's very, very weak. The man was ready to come this afternoon, that afternoon. Reb Chaim ran into the room. He poked his head into the room and he shares the good news. He says, Rani, I found somebody to circumcise you. He's coming this afternoon. The problem is there was a nurse in the room at that time and she heard what he said. She raised her eyebrows. You want to arrange a circumcision here? There is no way the hospital is going to approve this. Ronnie looks at this nurse and says, what are you afraid of? You're afraid that the circumcision is going to kill me? You're afraid that the rabbi who circumcised me won't know what he's doing and I'm going to die? I'm dying anyway. The doctor says I have 48 hours to live. Bring me whatever waivers you have. I won't sue you. Don't worry. I'll sign any paper you want and let the man come to give a circumcision. One of the daughters of this man, her name is Samantha living in Atlanta, she was visiting her dying father. She hears what's happening, the nurse told her. She freaks out. She comes in, she says to the nurse, my father is dying. He's not in his right mind right now. This Chabad rabbi is a religious lunatic. He's a crazy man. You should expel him from the hospital for trespassing and bothering an old man moments before his death, trying to force him to undergo a surgery. Get him out of this hospital. Rabbi Slavotitsky slipped out of the room. He knew that there was a Jewish doctor who practiced in the hospital, and that would be his only hope. He phoned his Jewish doctor. He told him the whole story. The doctor promised that he would look into it and do whatever he can. A few minutes later, he calls back Reb Chaim Slabatitsky and he says, the legal department of the hospital said, they will agree to this procedure with one condition. You have to find a male who's also an MD. He's also a certified doctor, a certified physician, and he has to be insured under the same umbrella policy as the hospital. If you have all these conditions, he's a male, he's a doctor, and he's insured under the same insurance, like the hospital, then they're going to let him do it. Huh. Go find somebody. He calls everybody that he knows in Florida. No avail. Georgia, Alabama, the Carolinas, Virginia. No success. At last, he finds a male who's a doctor who's living in Brooklyn, New York. He fits the bill. 
phones him, tells him the story. And the doctor, the moil, tells Reb Chaim, get me a ticket, I'm coming down. On the next day, a few hours before Rosh Hashanah, 3 o'clock p.m., several hours before welcoming the new year, an elderly Jew by the name of Rani was welcomed into the bris of Avram Avinu. Rani chose his own Hebrew name after the bris. And you know whose name he chose? He chose the name of another person who had his bris not at the age of 78, but at the age of 99. And you know who that was? He chose the name of Avraham. Rabbi Slabatitsky sat with Rani, who was now Avraham, after his bris, a few minutes before Rosh Hashanah. He squeezed his hand every time the pain spiked. Avram's eyes were closed from exhaustion and his voice was so weak, it disappeared after every few words. His oxygen levels were low. His body was weak. But this Jew who just had a bris spoke to Rabbi Slabatitsky. And this is what he told him. People always talk about Jewish guilt. Jews feel guilty. But you know, I'm a Jew and I never suffered from Jewish guilt. I never got the memo that you gotta be guilty as a Jew. It never reached me. I had a good life. I ran a successful business. I have two beautiful daughters. I own a house. I even own my own yacht, my own boat. I lived almost eight decades that way and I was happy. I never felt guilt pangs. I never felt regret. I never felt empty. I never looked for more and I never wanted to look for more. The doctor came in here yesterday and he told me that it looks like I have 48 hours to live. It triggered so many thoughts. I built a beautiful life. I built a fine life. But I realized in 48 hours I won't be here anymore. And then I discovered something. There was one thing that I did not have a relationship with. And you know what that was? That was the one thing I was taking with me. My soul. My soul. I didn't have a relationship with my soul, with my neshama. The only thing that will be left with me when everything else is gone. I never had a relationship with it. I didn't know about it. I can't tell you where it came from, Rabbi. But as soon as the doctor mentioned I have 48 hours to live, suddenly everything I was surrounded with my whole life evaporated. I felt empty. I had nothing. All my investments, my bank accounts, my house, my, ya my yacht, all my successes, all my fun, all my leisure, all my luxury, it was all gone, there was nothing there. And then I thought about the bris I never had. And I turned to my daughters and I said, get me a rabbi. And that's why I called you. At least now I have something to take up with me when I die. He looked at Rabbi Slabatitsky and he said these words, now I'm ready to meet God. Now I'm gonna interrupt the story for a moment on my own and in parentheses I'm gonna to say, to appreciate what this person did, you can open up a Gemara Masechta Voidizara, Daf Yud Ahmed Aleph, and read the story about Ktiya Bar Shalom. Or you can ask your father, your older brother to help you. Avoid Zora, Yud Ahmed Aleph, I think it is Ktiya Bar Shalom, and you'll appreciate what Rani did right before Rosh Hashanah. However, although the doctors gave him only 48 hours, the creator of the world decided that Avram should be given more time. And he gave him more time to be able to experience his new life as a Jew. Rani Avram celebrated his first Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as a full member of Avram Avinu's tribe. He heard the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. On Sukkot, Rabbi Chaim Slabatitsky walked two hours to the hospital with a lulav and an esrik 
so that Avram could shake it. As Avram took the lulav, the esrig, the hadassim, and the aravis, his hands shook as he made a blessing on the tilas lulav. Shechionu, v'kimonu, v'giyonu l'zmanazeh, for the first time in his life on a lulav. A few days later, as Jews around the world were getting ready to dance with the Torah on Simcha's Torah, an elderly man in a Florida hospital by the name of Avram passed away. His hands filled with the holy things he could take with him to the next world. But there's a postscript to the story. Their father passed away. Now his daughters have made arrangements beforehand for him to be cremated. You know what cremated is? For his body to be burnt into ashes and the ashes are scattered. It's much, much cheaper than buying and digging a grave and buying a coffin and burying the person and putting a tombstone. You have to buy a plot in the cemetery. So the two daughters, Maya and Samantha made arrangements for him to be create, cremated. But Reb Chaim promised this Jew he's going to have a full Jewish burial. He's going to come to Kev Yisrael. So he went to the daughters and he pleaded with them. He said, look what your father wanted. Respect your father's last wish. And the daughters agreed. Maya paid $2,000 towards the expenses of burial. Samantha was ready to give the $695 that she chipped in for the cremation, not a penny more. The problem is he needed another $9,000 to be able to perform a burial. Maya's 2,000 and Samantha's 695 would not cut it. Now this was a new rabbi in town. He did not have money, he did not have so many connections, but he put it on his credit card. He absorbed the remaining $9,000 in expenses. It was not easy for him, but he understood this is the right thing to do. This is what the Rebbein Shalom wants from him. This is his shlichus. This is his mission. Avram needs to be buried as a Jew, not Khalila cremated. He had a full Jewish burial. Reb Chaim took care of it. Kaddish was said. All the Jewish traditions were kept and maintained. Reb Chaim learned Mishnayis for him. Gave tzedakah for his neshama. Time has passed. The Slabatitskis wrote a Sefer Torah for the community, a new Sefer Torah for their shul. And they were now completing the Sefer Torah. Beautiful Hachnasa Sefer Torah in Fort Lauderdale. And the woman who donated much of the Sefer Torah invited her friends to come to the celebration of carrying the Sefer Torah from the shul outside under a chuppah with music and dancing and torches and candles bringing, into the, bringing it into the shul in the Arun Kodesh, dancing hakafas. And a lot of Jews, many of them were secular Jews, came to the festivities. Beautiful celebration. A few days later, Rebbe Tzenchayla Slabatitsky, Rebbe Chaim's wife, is going through her mail. And she sees a very nice check that came from a woman living in Atlanta. The check comes with a letter. The woman writes as follows. I came to the Sefer Torah celebration that you hosted last week. I came from Atlanta. My friend invited me to come and she sponsored the, 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 the Torah scroll. Watching the parade accompany the Holy Scroll down the streets of Fort Lauderdale and hearing people speak about their connection to Judaism and to the timeless values of Torah, it woke up a part in me that I did not know existed. I never planned to give my son a bar mitzvah. I never had a bat mitzvah. But after this celebration with the Torah scroll, I made arrangements for him to learn about Judaism with our local rabbi. I want him to know what it means to be a Jew. I am sending you a check. This check is to cover some of the costs of my father's Jewish funeral. Thank you for taking care of him when I would not. With a grateful heart, Samantha, daughter of Avraham, she paid up the $9,000 for her father's burial. I found this story so moving, so extraordinary. It teaches us so many things. First of all, it teaches you how to look at a Jew 
a Yiddish and a Shama, what a Jew is. Sometimes a Jew could live 78 years without any connection to Yiddishkeit. And there's no guilt. And you would think, eh, he doesn't really have a soul. He's part of the, he's the exception. You never, never underestimate what a Jew is. Jew is a piece of Hashem. Every Jew is a piece of Hashem. A chelik eleika mimal mamish, as it says in Tanya. A Jew is a fragment of the Rabbi Nashalaylam, a spark of infinity, a light of Hashem in this world. And it's something I can't change. This is who I am. This is who you are. You're infinite. You're sacred. You're beautiful. You're holy. You're awesome. You're wholesome. You're, you are splendid. Even if I make mistakes. And even if I'm estranged. And even if I make many mistakes. There's a connection. Because this is who I am. This is my essence. Even if I haven't practiced. Just like I can't change the color of my eyes. I can't change the color of my soul. This is the color of my soul. This defines my essence. This is what you see in the story with him and with the daughter. I also learned from it how sometimes we can invest our life in so many things, but at a moment of truth, you have to answer the question, did my investment go into the right places? Did I invest in something that is really real, really powerful, real eternal? And a lot of people are thinking about this now with the coronavirus. When so many of us, all of us, are stuck at home, we're quarantined at home. Most of us are not going to work. We can't go to shul. We can't go to school. Your tatis and mommies are not going to their offices, at least in the most part. Some are, but most are not. So many businesses have closed down or are on hold. And it's a time when... You actually ask yourself, what is real? What is the part of me that is indestructible, that nothing can destroy? And where am I really investing my life? Wow. Thank you, Reb Chaim and Chayla, for, for being the people you are and for, for such an incredible, incredible experience.